Control of ventilation is both a voluntary and involuntary process controlled by the brain. So we're going to look at some of those uh, controls right now. So the respiratory system, like all systems in the body, gets signals from both the parasympathetic and sympathetic receptors. The main neurotransmitter from the parasympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine and epinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system. So in the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, which is part of our autonomic nervous system, this is our resting phase. So at this point, um, our body uh, stimulates the flow of saliva so that we have plenty of uh, fluid to digest our food. Our heartbeat will slow down. Our bronchioles will naturally constrict. Uh, stimula it stimulates peristalsis and secretion so that we can digest our food. There is stimulation and release of bile and our bladder contracts. When we get a sympathetic output or a sympathetic pulse from epinephrine, our pupils dilate we have inhibition of saliva, our heartbeat accelerates, our bronchioles dilate so more flow can get down into the uh, alveolar sacs. Uh, peristalsis is decreased in our GI tract. We have conversion of glycogen to glucose and secretion of adrenaline and noradrenaline. Also, we have inhibition of our bladder contraction. So you've all probably felt some of those responses as we have had different resting and relaxation or fight, flight, or freeze responses. So once again, that's all an involuntary process sent from our autonomic nervous system. And now let's look at some of the respiratory centers of our brain. So the main areas of our brain that have control over ventilation are both in the brain stem. The medulla oblongata has the dorsal and ventral respiratory group, and the pons has both the apneustic and the pneumotaxic uh, group. We're also going to look at chemoreceptors, uh, and we're going to look a little bit at hypercapnia and hypoxia. So here is the uh, brain stem up here closer to the cerebral cortex would be the pons and down towards our spinal cord would be our medulla. So the dorsal respiratory groups are a specialized set of neurons that coordinate uh, our breath. So the dorsal respiratory group are mostly um, there to activate our inspiratory muscles. So they send these signals to our dorsal respiratory group and it lasts for about two seconds. And then that will cause the muscles of inspiration to relax and stop our inhalation. Then the specialty neurons also located in our medulla are the ventral respiratory group. The ventral respiratory group are uh, there to activate exhalation. So they could be more dormant during normal breathing. Um, and they actually are responsible for both uh, inhalation and exhalation, but they really do activate that exhalation of um, our breath and allow us to once again, start the process again. So both of the dorsal and ventral neurons in our medulla oblongata send these efferent signals to both the muscles of our diaphragm and our intercostal muscles. The coordination of the dorsal and ventral respiratory group takes place in the pons. So the pons is made up of our apneustic and pneumotaxic group. So the apneustic center in the pond sends signals to both our ventral and dorsal respiratory, uh, dorsal respiratory group. So 
if there's any issues with our apnoestic center, will the 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 uh, respiratory pattern will change and become like an apnoestic breathing pattern where there's deep gasping of an inspiration followed by a short exhalation that occurs when both the pneumotaxic center and apnoestic center are injured. The other portion is the pneumotaxic center or the pontine respiratory group. So the pontine group, um, once again, located in your pons, is there to regulate the stopping of inspiration. So it really controls and fine tunes the rhythm of that inspiration. It doesn't much control the exhalation as much as just says, okay, stop with inhalation. If that does get damaged, once again, uh, we could have an apnoustic or an ataxic breathing pattern. So that's the deep, gasp, uh, deep gasping followed by short exhalations. And it's just because that inspiration is not being told um, to stop. It's just really becoming unregulated and, and uh, going out of control. So people with head injuries do have a hard time with uh, controlling their, their, their breathing pattern. And so a lot of times um, the rhythm of inspiration does not become smooth. So failure of the respiratory components of the medulla would include if something happened and injured the medulla where there is then reduced blood flow to that area. That could happen with cerebral edema or intracerebral abnormalities, acute poliomyelitis, ingestion of drugs that uh, uh, depress the central nervous system, really any type of um, blunt trauma to the head, uh, any of that could have um, problems with your uh, dorsal and respiratory, dorsal and ventral respiratory group controlling that ventilation pattern. Let's now go into monitoring systems. There are two monitoring systems in our body the central and peripheral chemoreceptors. And as the name states, uh, they respond to the chemical, um, the chemical amount um, in those, those receptors, those chemoreceptors. And the most powerful stimulus known to influence the respiratory components of the medulla is an excess concentration of hydrogen ions in the cerebral spinal fluid. So the central chemoreceptors are located bilaterally and ventrally in the medulla, and they monitor hydrogen ion concentration in the cerebral spinal fluid, which is a clear colorless fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. So this fluid helps to maintain constant pressure in the brain despite changes in blood pressure and it transports metabolic waste products away from the brain and spinal cord back to the bloodstream. So uh, both carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions can cross over the blood brain barrier from the blood into that CSF. And as we have more carbon dioxide, we will then have more hydrogen ion concentrations. So what happens is if your medulla senses, or the central chemoreceptors, do sense hypoventilation for any reason, there will be an increase in carbon dioxide levels. That mixed with water will turn to carbonic acid and will have an increase in the carbonic acid levels then that will disassociate into more hydrogen ions and that will drop the pH, creating a very acidic environment. That will then stimulate the central chemoreceptors to tell the, both the diaphragm and the intercostals to increase our alveolar minute ventilation. Therefore, that will then decrease the carbon dioxide and hydrogen ion level, decrease alveolar ventilation. So, our control of ventilation constantly works in this way. Now, unfortunately, some people, when they have chronic carbon dioxide, air trapping, or car chronic high levels of uh, carbonic acid, so hypercarbia, then those patients will um, 
have a deactivation of these central chemoreceptors. And that's where our peripheral chemoreceptors come into play. Our peripheral chemoreceptors are um, specialized cells that react to low PaO2 or low oxygen level. And they're located at the bifurcation of the carotid arteries in the aortic arch. So what happens is when they sense a low PaO2, less than 60 millimeters of mercury in the blood, afferent, afferent or sensory signals will be sent to the medulla from the carotid bodies via vo both the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve, then efferent impulses to the respiratory muscles will tell the diaphragm and intercostals to contract, increasing ventilation. As we increase ventilation, that will help the PaO2 levels in our blood. So this does work um, until the PaO2 falls to below about 30, and then they do unfortunately get suppressed. So the peripheral chemoreceptors are mainly um, utilized by patients with chronic disease such as COPD. So low oxygen content conditions can be chronic anemia, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, and met hemoglobinemia levels. So they will also be um, altered due to those um, due to those uh, conditions as well. So factors that stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors other, other than increased, uh, uh, increased CO2 or decreased pH, so an increase in hydrogen ion concentration, an increase in lactic or ketone, those fixed acids in the body, hypoperfusion, increased temperature or nicotine. Okay, so uh, they will respond faster due to the direct stimulation by the CO2 molecule, which also helps the peripheral chemoreceptors respond. So therefore there will be an activated response with increased ventilation, peripheral vasoconstriction, an increase in our pulmonary vascular resistance, and an increase in systemic arterial hypertension, tachycardia, and an increase in our left ventricular performance. So anytime your body is starting to compensate, these will be activated. So finally, I wanna talk about oxygen-induced hypercapnia. And that happens with chronic uh, cardiopulmonary disease, such as, uh, such as uh, COPD or perhaps CHF. So when we have a reduced minute ventilation, that causes hypercapnia or high PaCO2 levels. VQ mismatching can also increase our hypercapnia because there's increased dead space, so wasted ventilation, due to reduced hypoxic vasoconstriction in the pulmonary vasculature. Also, the Haldane effect, if you remember, when our oxygen level gets low, that encourages bicarbonate then, or excuse me, hemoglobin to carry back and load up the carbon dioxide to take that back to the lungs. So if we don't allow for uh, the body to get uh, lower oxygen, then carbon dioxide uh, won't have as much space. And then finally, if you look at pressure gradients in the alveoli, if you have a higher amount of alveolar oxygen, just thinking about uh, inhalation and, and there being enough pressure and space there wouldn't be as much space for carbon dioxide in those alveoli. So all of those are physiologic reasons why um, if you have a patient with chronic cardiopulmonary disease, if you give them a higher amount of oxygen than needed, a higher fraction of inspired oxygen, it can actually induce hypercapnia. So you really want to keep your patient with COPD uh, at about two to four liters per minute via a nasal cannula or about 24 to 40% FiO2 if you're putting them on a specialty mask.